welcome back to J100. Today's lecture is on the press during the American period. So as you can see behind me, we are in Escolta in 1903. So just a little background. We know that Emilio Aguinaldo declared the first Philippine Republic um, on June 12, 1898, uh, where he declared the Philippines as an independent state. Um, he sent Felipe Agoncillo to Hong Kong to try to um, meet um, foreign ministers of other countries and get the Philippines to be recognized as an independent state. Um, of course, to say that one is really um, a country, an independent state, one has to be recognized by other nations. Unfortunately, this did not happen. Agoncillo was not successful. Um, and what Aguinaldo did not know was that the, what was that Spain and America was making a secret pact, uh, which led to the Treaty of Paris. Um, so, on December 10, 1898, um, the Treaty of Paris uh, gave the U.S. sovereignty over the Philippine Islands. So just a background on that. So what happened here? Um, Spain, while the Philippine Revolution was going on in the world, Spain was also losing its power, um, engaging in war, with the United with the with the United States, um, specifically over Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Guam. Um, with the Treaty of Paris, um, America declared itself um, uh, the well. Basically, they won over Spain. Um, the concession only with the Philippines is that the um, America had to pay Spain twenty million to gain sovereignty over this, 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 um, this colony, unlike getting Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Guam from Spain. So let me correct myself, the amount uh, was 20 million US dollars. So the Treaty of, <clears throat> the Treaty of Paris came into effect on April 11, 1899 when it was ratified by the two governments. Um, so technically, when the U.S. entered the Philippines, basically Manila Bay, um, the Treaty of Paris was not yet signed. And so when they were fighting or fighting the, the, the Spanish who were here um, to get the islands, um, Aguinaldo and company actually thought the Americans were on their side um, or their allies against Spain. What they did not know was that they were planning a takeover. Um, it took time because some of the, some of the um, legislators in the U.S. Senate was not in favor of, um, of America taking over as colonizers, um, but in, in, in any event, uh, they were convinced that it was for the best. So the Treaty of Paris marked the end of the Spanish Empire and actually also marked the beginning of the U.S. as a world power. Um, during the, this time, what papers existed? This we, we know that there was the revolutionary press, um, which was established during the Philippine Revolution against the Spanish government and now would shift, of course, to be against the American colonial government. And then establishment of new commercial publications because the Americans who came also put up newspapers and in fact introduced the Western or liberal style of journalism um, into the country. The American period also expanded media in the Philippines with the coming of cinema in 1904 and radio in 1922. 
so technically there was no formal censorship under the American period. However, um, there were two laws that prevented the revolutionary press from actually existing or um, if they did they had to do it secretly um, this is the sedition law which was established on november 4 1901 by the philippine commission headed by howard taft which passed this law and declared unlawful any covert or overt speech or publication that encouraged filipinos to fight the American colonial rule. Then, of course, there's libel. Very much like today's law, it is a public and malicious imputation of a crime, vice, or defect, real or imaginary, that tend to cause dishonor, discredit, or contempt to an ordinary judicial person or blacken the memory of the dead. Um, so the newspapers that continue to exist are La Independencia, which is, um, as we know, founded by Antonio Luna, El Geraldo de la Revolución, um, the paper of the Katipunan under Aguinaldo, and El Renacimiento, which is basically a commercial paper, but uh, is considered um, a revolutionary paper because it was written for Filipinos. So just a review and actually more data here. Um, so we know La Independencia was founded on or began on September 3, 1898. Um, it's the publication that continued um, and when at the onset of the American, the Philippine-American War, Rafael Palma took over uh, Antonio Luna as editor. So Luna, as you know, was appointed Supreme Chief of the Army under the Aguinaldo administration. So the, the thing about this paper, um, unlike La Republica Filipina, is that it was independent from the Malolos Congress. Um, and one of the things that that um, that's why Aguinaldo did not particularly like this paper um, because it was also critical when the Aguinaldo administration made mistakes. It also called, called it out. Um, there were columnists also that were not in favor of some policies and were very vocal about it, such as the columnist Lumpo, or obviously um, it was uh, Mabini you know, who who wrote these columns. Also notable is that this paper had the first Filipina journalists, uh, namely Rosa Sevilla and Florentina Arellano, who worked as part of the staff of La Independencia. And of course, um, Epifanio de los Santos was also one of the editors. Now, El Renilzamiento was founded in September 1901 and lasted until January 1910. It was written in Spanish. Remember, it was put up during the American period, but it was a Spanish language paper. Why was that? Uh, for one thing, most Filipinos spoke Spanish, not English, right? So, so they were educated in Spanish. Um, and so that was the language that was common at the time. So when they put up this paper, the target audience was really the Filipinos, um, not the Americans, all right? The, the also notable is that precisely because it was in Spanish, um, they could get away with writing many critical um, material against the American colonial government that could pass censors if yeah that um, was not obvious because most of the American um, colonizers did not really speak Spanish well um, unfortunately um, one of their very critical editorials the aves de rapina or birds of prey um, 
led to the famous libel case against the paper and its publishers and editors because it called um, one of the American officials corrupt. Um, well, basically because he was exploiting the Philippine natural resources for his own gain. Now, as you will read, and I will ask you to read that famous editorial. Apart from publications, Filipinos also went to theater to express their nationalism and anti-American sentiments. Walang Sugat was first published in 1898 and performed in 1902 at the Teatro Libertad. Now, so this play, which was written by Severino Reyes, who is better known as Lola Basang for all his stories, no? um, was a form of zarzuela. It was set during the Spanish period, but it had underpinnings or implications against the American colonial rule. Um, so basically, it spoke of Filipino suffering during the colonial rule and expe expressed patriotism. Um, it's actually a love story. You might want to read at least the synopsis of the play if you have not seen it. But I would also suggest that if you have a chance, you know, if one of the our many theater groups are performing it, do take the time to watch this play. It's very, actually, very entertaining. Now, there were also commercial publications, um, like, for example, the Manila Times, which was founded by Englishman Thomas Cohen and named after, of course, the famous London Times or The Times. Um, so Cohen was living in the Philippines. And this paper was created to serve mainly the Americans who were sent to Manila to fight in the Spanish-American War. Um, so we can say that the Manila Times is the oldest paper, but then there were times when it ceased publications, and that's why uh, we can say that the Manila Bulletin is the oldest continuously existing paper. Because, for example, the Manila Times had been closed um, for uh, during the martial law. It was, of course, shut down. Um, now, the American was another English language daily published by Franklin Brooks, of a New York journalist. Um, but it, it it lasted only a few years. The Manila Bulletin. We know that, as you know, it exists until the present. It as we said, it's the oldest continuously existing because it never stopped printing um, even during the martial law. Um, so it's the oldest continuously existing paper in the country. It was put up first by Carlson Taylor, who was an American, um, in the 1900s, okay, um, and later on sold to uh, Filipinos. Um, as we know that the Manila Bulletin was started as a shipping journal, so basically it reported the comings and goings of the ship and their cargo, um, but later on also um, started to report news. Even back then, uh, Manila Bulletin was always uh, catering to the powers that be basically they never really had they were they're never critical of the administration and always the news uh, that it contains always um, help inform people of policies of government or what was happening but nothing critical of the current administration then, of course, you had the Taliba Vanguardia Tribune chain. So these are three different papers. Um, so Taliba in Filipino, Vanguardia in Spanish, and Tribune in English, all founded by Alejandro Rosas Sr. in 1925 um, after he bought La Vanguardia in 1910 from Don Martin Ocampo, who, by the way, was the publisher also of 
El Renacimiento. So he had to sell uh, the papers um, primarily because the libel case um, against uh, El Renacimiento uh, resulted in his bankruptcy. So the Philippine Herald um, was another paper. This was found a little later in the 1920s um, and instigated by Senate President Manuel L. Quezon. So technically it was put up by the Taipans or the rich Filipinos who were pushing for the Commonwealth government and supporting the presidency of Quezon. Um, so it was, it was, as said here in the slide, set up by a group of wealthy followers to help him counteract the anti-Filipino slant in the foreign-owned press. So that's the official reason. Um, the unofficial reason is also to, to boost his leadership um, because it was already um, the start of the Commonwealth period where you have the Filipinos governing themselves, but still under um, the U.S., the, the United States. Other publications, of course, um, existed. Now, for example, the Philippine Magazine, which um, existed in 1905, um, was a semi-government publication for public school teachers. So it was there was a lot of information that they could use for class and also to upgrade their knowledge. Um, in 1929, Harden Drop um, took over and broadened its scope. And basically, it became a cultural magazine. The Philippine Free Press, which began in 1907, um, was put up by Judge W.H. Kincaid as a bila bilingual English and Spanish newspaper. Um, in 1908, Robert McCulloch Dick, a former editor of the Manila Times, bought the paper for one peso and used his life savings of 8,000 pesos as operating capital. So the Philippine Free Press, you might say, was the beginning of um, the watchdog type of press that uh, in the Philippines. Um, you could see that the Americans brought their American style of journalism um, in the country. Um, so it was critical even of the American colonial um, government um, or the Commonwealth government um, and basically reported the events of um, that was happening in the country. Um, this was closed down during World War II, but later on resurrected um, after the martial law period. Lee Y was founded by Ramon Roses, the son of Alejandro Roses Sr. in 1923, and it was co-edited by Severino Reyes or Lola Basha. So the first, um, it was the first weekly Tagalog magazine and enjoyed the same success and perhaps even more than the free press. So unlike the free press, which had serious political articles, Liwayway was more on culture. It had literature, it had short stories, poetry, etc. No, so um, it also, that's how Severino Reyes became famous. Um, as Lola Bashang because he started this storytelling series in this magazine. Then of course, the American period brought the beginning of broadcast news. So the first um, radio station that, that was properly commercial um, was the KZKZ, which began in 1924 by Henry Herman Sr., a retired American soldier who was also owner of the Manila Electric Company. So later, when he start, after he started the, this radio, um, he set up the company, Radio Corporation of the Philippines. 
which later on, after several changes of ownership, we now know as the Manila Broadcasting Company. Um, and of course, we know that later on also that this, it stopped being an AM uh, radio and became FM under in the 1980s under Danding Kuwanko. Uh, there were two radio stations that still exist in the AM band. Um, the, DZ, the KZRB, now known as DZRB, which was established on September 3, 1927 by the U.S. Information Service. Now it is run by the AFP. It is the official radio of the armed forces. Um, so it still exists. Um, and the KZRH, now known as DZRH, established on July 15, 1939 by Samuel Gatches, own, the owner of the H.E. Hickok Company, which was actually a department store in Escolta. Now, um, we had the call sign KZ when we were still under the Americans, but once we gained our independence in 1946, the international call sign of the Philippines became DZ. That's why um, if you notice, all the call signs of our radio stations start with the DZ something. DZBB, DZMM, DZRH. All right, so that gives us a brief summary of the press during the American period. Um, now we have the oral reports so that we get to know the personalities behind the media more closely.